Hi YouTube, it's Joshua Miles and welcome back to my channel. Before we delve into this case, I'd just like to give a massive thank you to the people over at Ridge for sponsoring this episode. The Ridge wallet is an amazingly light and sleek wallet made specifically to hold cards and designed beautifully to fit into any pocket. With two metal plates held together by a durable elastic band, it's super easy to fit the cards you need for your day-to-day -day ventures inside and to only take the cards you need out with you. So it's time Time to throw out your old bulky wallets and switch to this incredible slimline wallet. If you, like me, know someone who is super difficult to buy for, whether that's for Christmas or birthdays or for any other events, this wallet will make the perfect present. A wallet is something that people don't particularly go out and buy for themselves, which is what makes it such an ideal gift idea. The Ridge wallet comes in a large range of colours and styles, including carbon fibre, aluminium and titanium, so you're sure to find a wallet that'll suit anybody in your life. The kind people over at Ridge have hooked you all up with a little holiday deal. Head on over to ridge.com forward slash Joshua, choose from their stunning line of wallets and make sure you use Use code Joshua to get 10% off at checkout. Again, thank you to the people at Ridge for helping to keep this channel afloat. And with all that being said, let's delve right into this case. People say Ted Bundy didn't show any emotion. I showed emotion. When 15-year-old Martha Moxley was found savagely murdered on Halloween in 1975, no one would have imagined that the search for her murderer would lead to the doorstep of one of America's most popular families, the Kennedys. The 31st of October 1975 was just as most holidays were in the United States of America, filled with decorations and big plans for celebrating the holiday, and Halloween 1975 was no different from years past. As with many of the wealthier family-friendly communities, Bellhaven in Greenwich, Connecticut had spared no expense in preparing for the annual spooky night. With decorations filling every home and garden, you definitely knew that this was a very high-profile community with every inch of space available dripping in expensive decorations. Bellhaven was the pinnacle of the American dream. It was the richest neighborhood in the richest town in Connecticut, hidden within a private gated enclave. The 30th of October, the night before Halloween, was popularly celebrated as Mischief Night, a night where the local kids would go out to play meaningless, playful pranks on the neighbourhood. From throwing toilet paper around to smashing pumpkins, it was a night for harmless fun. That was until 1975, when tragedy struck the community of Bellhaven. Martha Elizabeth Moxley was born on the 30th of August 1960 to parents Dorothy and David Moxley. She was the second child born to her parents, Martha having an older brother called John. They were a very happy and successful family of four. Dorothy was a stay-at-home mother and David worked as a highbrow accountant at an international accounting and management firm. The family initially lived together in Piedmont, California, though shortly after Martha had turned 14, the family relocated to the affluent neighbourhood of Bell Haven in Connecticut. Dorothy, Martha's mother, would later states that Bellhaven, quote, was one of those neighborhoods the kids could just go meet people, very safe, 
Everybody liked everyone. Martha had actually been voted best personality in middle school and was very successful in her educational pursuits, achieving straight A's. Alongside her education, Martha also played basketball. Martha's brother John would later describe her as, quote, a person who had everything in the world going for her. She was friendly, she was athletic, she was talented in the arts. Everything seemed to come very easily to Martha. She was well liked within her local community and was always seen to be smiling. Though, despite her apparent innocent and happy-go-lucky persona, Martha also had a very cheeky side to her, which oftentimes landed her in trouble with her parents, being grounded and the like. That particular mischief night, on the 30th of October 1975, Martha had actually been grounded and was not supposed to be allowed to go out and join in on the harmless pranks due to some bad behaviour from the weekend prior. But Martha's mother, Dorothy, didn't want her daughter to feel left out and ultimately caved to Martha's begging. Dorothy granted Martha permission to go out that evening with her friends just for the evening. And so Martha and a few of her friends set out for an evening of harmless pranks around their neighborhood. As the evening began to draw to an end, Martha and her friends stopped by the home of Thomas and Michael Skackle. You see, Thomas, or Tommy, was actually Martha's boyfriend, kind of, at the time, and they wanted to see one another. Thomas and Michael were 17 and 15 years old, respectively, and were the nephews of Ethel Skackle and her husband, Robert F. Kennedy, the brother of the late president, John F. Kennedy. This connection to the Kennedys made them part of the wealthiest and most well-known families in the community or in the country. Thomas and Michael were part of a large family group, with the head of the family being Rushton Skackle and his wife, Anne, who had together six sons and a daughter. Unfortunately, Anne Skackle had passed away due to cancer in her brain in 1973, when Thomas was just 15 years old and when Michael was 13 years old. And following Anne Skackle's passing, the entire family was thrown into a state of despair and mourning. Rushton Skackle, Anne's husband and the figurehead of the family, was an alcoholic prior to his wife's passing, and his alcoholism spiralled following it. As a result of this, he had to enlist the aid of nannies and cooks to ensure the household continued to run as smoothly as it had before. The Skackle children were actually well known within their local community as being quite a handful and for being disrespectful to the staff employed in their home, likely due to the lack of discipline and authority from their alcoholic father. It was fairly common for staff who were employed to handle the children to only maintain their role for a few months before quitting on accounts of the children's abusive attitudes and behaviours towards them. One nanny would later state that she would come home with her legs black and blue with bruises after the kids had kicked her when she had told them no. All the children had been negatively affected by the loss of their mother, though it seemed as if the loss had affected Michael Skackle more than his siblings. At the age of 13, Michael had started to steal alcohol from his father's liquor cabinets or from the wine cellar, and he had started to drink regularly. Despite the unruliness of the Skackle home, they were still known in the community to be quite a popular family. The children still had many friends. There was a large group of children that would hang out together around Bell Haven, which consisted of Thomas, Michael, Martha, and some of their mutual friends. Martha had kept a diary for as long as she could remember, and she regularly wrote in her diary about the adventures the group would get up to. In particular, an entry in Martha's diary described a day where the group had gone driving in Thomas's car. Martha had sat in Thomas's lap and had steered the car, though she made note of the way in which Thomas had been holding her, touching her knee and holding her waist, and how that made her feel uncomfortable. A few days after that entry, Martha had written about how much of an asshole Michael had been towards her. He had told her that she needed to stop leading him on if she didn't like him. The relationship between Michael and his brother Thomas had been one of a typical sibling rivalry, always trying to beat each other in everything they did, which included competing for the girls they liked. When Thomas had learned of Michael's crush on Martha, he had decided to pursue her solely as a way to annoy his brother. Martha had written about all of this in her diary, 
detailing how Michael had been an asshole to her and how he had been very angry about the whole situation. The last time that Martha had been seen, on the night of the 30th of October 1975, had been when her best friend Sheila had spotted her with Thomas, quote, falling together behind the fence, near the pool in the Skakel family home's backyard, at around 9.30pm. Whenever her children were out of the house late at night, Dorothy, Martha's mother, would always stay up to ensure that they got home safe. So when Martha hadn't returned home by 2am, she began to grow very worried. Dorothy began phoning Martha's best friend's landline phone to try to find out where Martha was. Martha's best friend's mother had actually been the one to answer Dorothy's call, and she immediately woke up Sheila, Martha's best friend, to try to find some answers. Sheila told Dorothy over the phone that she hadn't seen Martha since about 9.30pm, the same time when she had seen Martha with Thomas, quote, falling together behind the fence near the Skakel family pool. Sheila reassured Dorothy, saying that Martha was likely still with Thomas. At 3.45am, after exhausting all all of her options, and after being unable to get a hold of her daughter, Dorothy phoned the police and reported Martha as missing. Following that call, Dorothy rang Sheila back up again, who was still expressing no concern for Martha's well-being, justifying her disappearance as being a result of the mischief night, believing Martha to have still been out causing trouble with Thomas. Dorothy knew something was wrong deep down in her guts and waited for her daughter to return home on the sofa by the window, eventually falling asleep. For a few moments after waking, Dorothy felt peaceful and at ease. That was until the reality hit her like a train. She rushed up the stairs and into Martha's bedroom, hoping and praying that she had snuck back into the house while she had been asleep. Though, when she burst into her daughter's room, she was met with an emptiness that filled her with dread. Fear for her daughter's well-being set in, and Dorothy began to phone all of Martha's friends to try and get any information she could about her daughter's whereabouts. None of the girls that Dorothy contacted had seen Martha since the previous nights when they had all been together at the Skakel family home. Subsequently, Dorothy decided to go straight over to the Skakel family home to go get her daughter, which, coincidentally, was just up the road. Though, when she knocked upon the solid black wooden door, only more dread would come her way. Michael Skakel had answered the door and had told Dorothy that he had no idea where Martha was. In a state of desperation, Dorothy noticed a big camper van that was parked in the family's driveway and asked Michael whether she could check in the camper van to see if Martha was in there. Michael agreed to Dorothy's request, though the camper van was simply another stab in the gut for Dorothy, as she found it to be empty. Dorothy then made her excuses to leave, thanked Michael for his help, and made her way to her friend Jean's house, which was just a few doors down from the Skakel family home, to ask for some help. When she got there, Jean offered her a cup of coffee while they tried to figure out where Martha could be. As we previously discussed, the community of Belhaven was known to have been very safe and nothing bad had ever really occurred there. As Dorothy and Jean had coffee and tried to figure out what to do next, Sheila, Martha's best friend, had started walking around the neighborhood looking for Martha. The worry for her best friend's well-being had finally set in, and it was as she was walking around the neighbourhood that she decided to check the last place that she had seen Martha, the Skakel's backyard, though Sheila was unable to find any sign of Martha. She then decided to look in Martha Moxley's own backyard, and it was in Martha's own backyard that a grievous discovery was made. Sheila found Martha lying beneath a large pine tree, and Sheila immediately knew something was very much the matter. She rushed in a state of hysteria to the front of the Moxley family home to try and find an adult who could help. Jean and Dorothy had just been finishing off their coffees with a plan to comb through the entire neighbourhood and contact the police again when they heard Sheila's screams. Dorothy knew in her gut that the screams did not bring good news, and immediately she began to break down. Jean decided that it would be best if she were to go and find out what the screaming was all about, while Dorothy waited in the kitchen. Sheila spotted Jean emerging from her home and ran over to her, and through her tears, she told Jean about what she had discovered. 911 was then promptly contacted. Jean then had to go and break the news to Dorothy, who, when Jean walked back into the kitchen, asked, is she dead? Jean replied simply by saying, 
I think so. Martha had been found lying face down underneath the pine tree in her back garden, with her trousers around her ankles. She had sustained multiple blunt force traumas to her head and had part of a golf club protruding from her neck. Investigators discovered that the golf club had actually been broken into four different pieces due to it being used to bludgeon Martha, the sheer force behind the attack shattering the club. Whoever had attacked Martha had done so in such a violent manner and with such strength and emotion that the golf club's metal shaft had snapped and had caused Martha's skull to have severe depression fractures. The handle of the golf club was not present at the crime scene, with only the other three pieces being accounted for, one of those pieces driven through Martha's neck and the other two discarded on the ground surrounding her body. Despite Martha being found with her trousers and underwear pulled down to her ankles, Investigators were unable to find any indication of sexual assault or rape occurring. They did discover blood spots and splatters on the driveway leading up to Martha Moxley's family home, indicating that she had likely been first struck by the golf club as she walked up her drive. But how did Martha end up under the pine tree? The Skakel brothers, Thomas and Michael, came under a large amount of scrutiny after the police determined the golf club used as the weapon in Martha's murder belonged to a golf club set owned by Anne Skakel before she died. Rushton Skakel, Anne's alcoholic husband and the father to Thomas and Michael, categorically refuted that the Skakel family had any involvement, arguing that Thomas and Michael oftentimes left the golf clubs out and around the property so anyone could have found the clubs and used them in the murder. Investigating officers spent months interviewing hundreds of people from the surrounding area, even conducting polygraph tests on several of their interviewees. Though, if you've watched this channel for a while, you'll know my opinion on polygraph tests and their reliability. They're inadmissible in court for a reason. After all of this questioning, the investigators had narrowed their suspect list down to just three people. Thomas Skakel was at the top of that list. He had been the last known person to have seen Martha alive, and with a less than solid alibi, suspicions of his involvement were very, very high. Thomas claimed in his alibi that he had parted ways with Martha that evening just after 9.30pm and had seen her walking off towards her house. He then stated that he had stayed downstairs in his house and watched the television with Kenneth Littleton, who was the Skakel's live-in tutor. Initially, this alibi appears to be somewhat solid, but inconsistencies between Thomas's alibi and statements given by other people to the police quickly began to surface. Sheila, Martha's best friend, had told the police that she had last seen Martha at around 9.30pm with Thomas near the pool. So how can Martha also have been leaving to go home at the same time? When the Skakel's live-in tutor was questioned, Kenneth Littleton, he claims that Thomas hadn't actually joined him to watch television until closer to 10.30pm that evening. This left an hour-long gap in the timeline. What had Thomas and Martha done in the hour they had been unaccounted for? Michael Skakel was second on the police's list of suspects. Michael's alibi was that he had been over at a cousin's house watching television at the time the murder had taken place, though his cousin never actually verified his alibi. Third and finally on the suspect list was the Skakel's live-in tutor, Kenneth Littleton. Kenneth Littleton had only started working for the Skakel family at the day that Martha had been murdered, and unbeknownst to Rushton Skakel, who had been the one to hire Kenneth, he had actually been fired from his previous job after they had learned of previous burglary charges on Kenneth's criminal record. Kenneth had actually pleaded guilty to these burglary charges and had received a five-year probational sentence, a sentence which he had failed to include on his resume when he had applied for the live-in tutor position. The fact alone that Kenneth already had a criminal record warranted his inclusion on the suspect list. Unfortunately, the investigating officers had been unable to uncover any concrete evidence to charge any of the three suspects, and with Russian Skakel growing tired of cooperating with the police, the time had run out. Rushton Skakel halted the police's access to his family and their property on the 22nd of January 1976, and consequently, by the end of 1976, the case of Martha Moxley's murder 
grew cold. It wouldn't be until 15 years later, in 1991, that her case would be reopened. It was in 1991 that the rape trial against William Kennedy Smith brought this case, Martha Moxie's murder, back into the public eye. Rushton Skakel, as a result of this, became set on trying to put the rumours that his sons had been involved in the murders to bed, and so hired a private investigator firm in an attempt to clear the family name. Now, in hindsight, this was a very bad move on Rushton's part, as the report, known publicly as the Sutton Report, eventually found its way into the hands of journalists and detectives five years after it was made in 1996. In the Sutton reports, the Skakel family had been assured that the investigation would be completely private and wouldn't be revealed to the public, with everyone involved in the report's creation being made to sign non-disclosure agreements. However, the Skakel family failed to get one vital person to sign a non-disclosure agreement, a person who was hired fresh out of college and who was working for minimum wage. The person who had been hired to compile the private investigator's findings, including psychiatric reports and interviews, into a narrative form with a timeline of events. This young man had quickly become emotionally invested in the case and had developed sympathy for Martha's mother Dorothy, who had been living for years with no justice for her daughter's murder. As a result of this, the young man reached out to a journalist and gave this journalist the full report. The report was then published publicly. After its publication, the young man was confronted about his involvement in the leaking of the reports and was then forced into signing a non-disclosure agreement so he couldn't speak out about the report any further. It is believed that the person who had confronted this young man had been a representative of the Kennedy family, somebody who had been tasked with trying to minimise the damage done to the Kennedy family reputation following the report's publication. The details of this report were very telling. The report reveals that both of the Skakel boys, Thomas and Michael, had admitted to lying in their statements to the police about their whereabouts on the night of Martha's murder. Thomas reveals that yes, he had been at home at 9.30pm that night, but he hadn't gone inside to watch television with Kenneth, the live-in tutor. He had actually caught up with Martha before she had gotten back home, and he had returned back to watch television with Kenneth about 20 minutes after he had claimed to. During that 20 minutes that he was with Martha that he failed to mention to the investigators, Thomas claimed to have engaged in sexual acts with Martha before they had parted ways and gone home. This places Thomas back at his home at around 10pm that evening, which more or less aligns with Kenneth's accounts of that evening, reducing the likelihood that Kenneth had been involved in Martha's murder. The report further details that Michael had admitted that he had not been at his cousin's house that evening watching television, as he had told the police. He had, in fact, been drunkenly stumbling around the neighbourhood and found himself at Martha Moxley's family home. Michael then claimed to have climbed the tree where Martha would later be found murdered underneath, which provided Michael with a vantage point, allowing him to peer directly into Martha's bedroom window. Michael then claims to have masturbated in the tree, imagining Martha sleeping in the dark bedroom. Once he had finished, he claims to have climbed back down from the tree and to have gone home. In Michael's own admittance, he had placed himself at the scene of the crime. The private detectives concluded that it was implausible that Michael had been able to simply walk away from Martha Moxie's home, as he had claimed, without walking straight past Martha's deceased body. The report ended by listing Michael Skakel as being the top suspect in Martha's murder. The final reports indicated that Thomas hadn't murdered Martha Moxley, and that Michael had been highly likely to have been responsible for her death. The reports even suggested that Thomas may have helped his brother in moving Martha's body after Michael had killed her, but it was clear that Thomas's involvement was highly likely to have been limited to just that. When Rushton Skakel read the reports, he was extremely shocked by its findings, and subsequently handed over 750,000 US dollars to the private investigator firm and buried the report. And as Rushton intended, the report remained out of the public eye, hidden away, allowing the Skakel family to continue on with their lives. One of the Skakel brothers had ended the life of a bright young woman, Martha, and their punishment was to continue living their privileged life as normal, something Martha and her family would never be able to do again. 
It is absolutely despicable and disgusting that Rushton Skakel attempted to cover up this report to save face. As Michael Skakel's life carried on, he met and then married a professional golfer in 1993 called Margot Sheridan. They had met through Margot's uncle, who had been friends with Michael's father, Rushton. In 1998, Michael and Margot had a son who they named George and moved to Hope Sound, Florida. Michael believes that he had gotten away with murder but his privileged, justice-avoiding world was about to come tumbling down all around him. In June of 1998, the same year Michael and Margot's son was born, a one-man grand jury was convened by District Attorney Jonathan Benedict to review all the evidence against Michael Skakel as a result of the leaked reports. It was determined that there was, in fact, enough evidence to charge Michael Skakel with Martha Moxley's murder. The very same day that the grand jury had made this determination and the warrant for his arrest was issued, Michael surrendered to the police. His bail was posted at 500,000 US dollars, but with Michael being from a wealthy and privileged family, his bail was quickly paid and he was released pending trial. Following Michael's arrest in January of the year 2000, Michael's wife, Margot, filed for a divorce. Margot actually spoke out through her lawyer, stating that, quote, any normal person would be shook up. It's a little unsettling. Her lawyer also said that Margot had been placed under a judicial gag order that had been obtained by Michael Skakel to ensure that Margot, quote, couldn't speak out against him. On the 7th of June, 2002, in Norwalk, Connecticut, when Michael Skakel was 42 years old, he was found guilty for the murder of the then 15-year-old Martha Moxley. He was sentenced to life in prison with the possibility of parole after 20 years. The trial against Michael saw over 40 witnesses being put on the stand. Some of these witnesses had been former classmates of Michael's from a reform school that he had attended between 1978 and 1980 from the ages of 17 to 19. This reform school was called the Elan School which in itself could have an entirely separate video on account of the monstrosities that occurred there. Michael's father Rushton had sent Michael to the reform school as he couldn't handle Michael's bad attitude and drinking problem. Hypocritical, I know. At the time, the Elan School, which was located in Maine, had been where the rich sent their children when they had become too much for them to handle. Unbeknownst to the parents, or simply with the parents not caring, they willingly handed their children over to this horrific boarding school. When the children were in this school, they were subjected to various extremely controversial behavioural therapies and modifications. They had even been a fighting ring, where children were pitted against one another to be disciplined for bad behaviour. A witness in Michael's trial had stated that Michael had told him that he had taken a golf club out of a bag and had been running through the woods before blacking out on the night of Martha's murder. Quote, he said he didn't know if he did it. He couldn't remember if he did it. Another witness told the courts that Michael used to brag about what he had done, saying, quote, I'm going to get away with murder. I'm a Kennedy. Following his sentencing, Michael was sent to the Garner Correctional Institution in Newton, Connecticut. Dorothy Moxley, Martha's mother, was asked by a reporter following the trial for her thoughts of the verdict. She replied by saying, quote, Today is a day where there is a winner and a loser. I just hate those days. I wanted to find justice for Martha. That's what this is. It's all about Martha. I have empathy for the Skakel family. It took over two decades before justice for Martha was served. And unfortunately, it was a justice that wouldn't be served for very long. After serving just 11 years for the murder of Martha, Michael was released on the 21st of November 2013 on parole after his case had been brought back in front of a judge in October of that same year. Michael was released from prison after a $1.2 million bond had been paid and naturally parole rules were set that he had to follow. After his release, Michael was monitored with a GPS tracking device and instructed to not have any contacts with the Moxley family. He was further forbidden from leaving the state of Connecticut without prior written approval from the state, 
But after consideration, that term was actually dropped and he was granted permission to relocate to Westchester County, New York, to be with his family. The reason for the judge granting Michael's early release was due to the judge's ruling that his old lawyer had failed to give him an adequate defence during his trial, as his defence lawyer had allegedly been too invested in the media frenzy and celebrity that had come along with defending a Kennedy relative in a trial. When Martha's mother Dorothy spoke to a magazine in 2016, three years after Michael had been released, she said, quote, it has been 41 years since Martha died. When you gather all this information for such a long time, you get to a point where you put it all together and it just fits. Soon after Martha's murder, we offered a $100,000 reward for any information that would lead to the arrest of whoever murdered Martha. All the tips we received were about Michael. On the 4th of May 2018, the Connecticut Supreme Court overturned Michael's conviction despite heavy protests from the Moxley family and from the public who were aware of this case. This case had vast amounts of media coverage over the decades and has been rooted in the public eye. Multiple books, documentaries and docuseries were created covering this case which retold the murder of Martha Moxley from a wide variety of different points of views. All of this coverage came to the same conclusion. Michael Skakel was the one who had murdered Martha. On the 30th of October 2020, earlier this year, 45 years to the day after Martha had been murdered, the prosecution announced that they will not retry the case against Michael Skakel due to there not being enough surviving witnesses or any new evidence. All of this fails to answer one major question. Why? It is my belief that Michael murdered Martha out of rage. Perhaps he had learned that Thomas and Martha had engaged in sexual acts and he attacked Martha in a purely emotionally motivated attack. He may not have intended to murder Martha, it may not have been premeditated, but it's clear that Michael used his sheer privilege and wealth and contacts to ensure that he would never have to pay for his actions. Meanwhile, Martha's family has to live every single waking moment with the pain and trauma that Michael's actions have caused them. They have received no justice, they have no confidence in the justice system, and they have lost a loved member of their family who they will never be able to hug again. Perhaps this case is a clear example of how those in privileged positions are able to avoid being held responsible for their crimes. Perhaps this case is a result of a Kennedy family cover-up. The truth is something we may never learn. All we can hope is that Martha's family is able to somehow find peace despite the lack of justice. And that's everything that I have for you in today's episode. Let me know what you thought of this case down in the comment section below. Again, a massive thank you to Ridge for sponsoring today's episode. Make sure you go to rich.com forward slash Joshua and use code Joshua to get 10% off your order at checkout. Be sure to subscribe to this channel and hit that bell icon so you can be notified every single time I post a brand new true crime video, just like this one. Follow me over on Instagram and Twitter if you want to. And with all that being said, I'll see you in the next case.